Good morning. Okay, I, want, I want to open the morning session with uh, Michael Douglas's talk on exploring the Keller potential. Okay. Are we, is everybody? Okay, thanks. Uh, it's a real pleasure for me to be uh, back in Israel and uh, here with you to celebrate Eliezer and uh, Shimon's uh, birthday. Of course, there's already been, uh, you know, a you know, huge, huge quantity of well-justified uh, tribute. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll tell a very, very brief story. So I've known Eliezer very short time on the scale of these things, maybe 10 years. And uh, so one of my first uh, experiences, I mean, we, we met at Rutgers, but uh, this was in 97, just after I'd uh, written this paper on non-commutative uh, geometry with Alan Kahn and Albert Schwartz. And, uh, you know, it, it was a, you know, especially, you know, coming out of this, you know, string theory world, it seemed like a rather strange uh, thing to do. And I was you know, wondering, I might, and you know, corrupted, associating with these mathematicians and so forth. And uh, so I come to CERN to uh, speak about this and, uh, you know, wondering, and, you know, people don't really know what to think. And then I run into uh, Eliezer, and he uh, kind of stops me in a hall and says, well, you know, I saw your, your paper on non-commutative uh, geometry. You know, thank you. Thank you for writing this paper. You know, and just this, this sort of heartfelt appreciation. You know, you've been working on BPS states and dualities, and you know, just fit right in. And uh, you know, of course, one doesn't forget that kind of uh, response. And it, it did help convince me. Uh, here's here's something important. So uh, here's a, here's a little chance to give back a little bit of this uh, appreciation. So uh, I'm going to talk about uh, a uh, well. You'll, you'll you'll see, obviously, a uh, you know very central problem in uh, fundamental physics trying to uh, start with uh, bare theories and uh, derive low energy effective descriptions. So, uh, you know, something one hears all about. And this will be from this slightly more mathematical point of view that, uh, you know, on some level we, you know, we know something about the physics and we want a uh, technique or a, uh, you know, calculation or procedure that will just solve this problem for us. You know, maybe we can get new physics out, but in any case, uh, something with uh, great, uh, you know, scope of uh, application and uh, just, you know, solve the problem. So, in particular, this problem of starting perhaps with a supersymmetric gauge theory or a string compactification and driving a supersymmetric effective Lagrangian. So, in particular, the uh, superpotential and the Kähler potential. And so, a very uh, well-known example is to start with the uh, pure super yang mill theory, n equals 1, and, uh, you know, a simple superspace Lagrangian. And, uh, of course, one of the early and central results in this subject is to derive an effective theory for the field describing the Gagino condensate, this trace W alpha square, which we call S. This is the uh, famous veneziano yankelevich superpotential. And uh, it's very simple. Is this S log S, which you can argue by analogy to two dimensions. There's an argument that uh, this exactly reflects the, uh, what you need to describe the U1R anomaly in the theory. But then you solve for supersymmetric vacua, and you find N vacua with an exponentially small condensate, just as you should, exponentially small vacuum energy, just as you should, from almost you know, no input. So. Okay, so there, there's a you know solution, as I said, that, that just you know that that nails the problem right on of describing these supersymmetric vacua, and uh, so you'd like to you know, generalize this, and this has been you know the topic of a huge amount of work. Of course, you need more more ideas, and uh, I can't you know that would be a whole talk just to review this. One of the recent developments that. Uh, you know, vastly generalizes this is this matrix model solution by Graf and Voff, uh, Cachazo et al. work that uh, I was involved in, where uh, you can take essentially any n equals one theory and uh, take the superpotential and plug it into this matrix model. So you just integrate over the fields considered as formal n by n 
matrices, you know, there's the, not the original N, it's just some formal large N, you add essentially the Venetiano Nikhilovich superpotential, one for each factor in the gauge group, you then minimize this in the gauging of condensate variables. And uh, I thought I had a, excuse me. Okay, and uh, you reproduce uh, from a perturbative calculation this full non-perturbative instanton expansion. So it uh, gets started with this and then somehow completes that to a you know, fairly general solution of a lot of gauge theories, if you can calculate this. Okay, so now another loosely related and really precisely related in the context of string duality is uh, if you compactify the 2B string on a collab, yeah, there's this very general uh, Kukov, Alpha, Taylor, Witten expression for a superpotential. So this depends on the complex structure, this reform. It depends on some choices of flux. And, uh, you know, in general, this requires a lot of mathematics to calculate. But in some examples, for example, you go near a conifold point. I'll talk about that some later. This disappeared in Igor's talk, for example. The uh, modulus, it depends on, is the volume of some three cycle of the Claude yeah, And then you find that the conjugate period, some conjugate three cycle intersects, is exactly this S log S. And this formula magically turns into the VY superpotential again, adding these two terms. And uh, so then that's no coincidence. If you look at the geometry, as I'll describe later, you have a in the limit of a cascade that Igor talked about up here, n equals one super Yang Mills theory, and now you have a dual as a uh, compactification that you can understand in gravity with uh, flux. So, okay, so another far-reaching generalization, and uh, you know, although it's hardly a solved problem, we know a lot about computing the superpotential. And we can find out a lot about the supersymmetric vacua, but we know much, much less about the Kähler potential. Okay, we don't have these uh, beautiful arguments of holomorphy and anomalies and so forth. And uh, you know, on the other hand, one feels you know this is equally fundamental. It must satisfy equally rich and powerful constraints. We just don't really know what they are. So, what would be the, the physical reasons and uh, why haven't people focused on this? Well, I mean, people you know, would like to know this. Obviously, if you actually want the masses of any particles, you need canonically normalized kinetic terms, and so you need to know the Kähler potential to get that. Uh, more generally, although the superpotential sufficed in general to find the supersymmetric vacua, even the existence of supersymmetry breaking vacua depends on the Kähler potential, and then this basic scale question of the scale of breaking, that's basically the length of the F terms, that depends on the Kähler potential. Uh, here's the supergravity expression. So uh, here the Kähler potential even enters as a uh, prefactor and then the covariate derivative condition. So here in supergravity you can even have supersymmetric vacuum which exists only by virtue of the existence of the Kähler potential, this DW, it's this DK term in the covariant derivative DW, so what sometimes called Kähler stabilized vacua. And uh, then if you step back from these, you know, kind of standard physics problems, if you think about, you know, what would we like to know about some landscape of, of you know, configuration space containing vacuous string theory, you'd like to know something about the metric, you know, which follows from the Kähler potential. And uh, you may not want to know exact results, but you certainly want to know things like is such and such at finite distance or infinite distance. Uh, this question of uh, how far one rolls, for example, in inflation is very central in inflationary physics and predictions. One can also ask questions about the volume of some region in configuration space. It's measured in Planck units in four-dimensional theory. And uh, one can actually fairly easily argue that that's the leading estimate in many cases for the uh, number of vacua you expect to be in that region. And it's basically, the, the simplest argument is that in supergravity, you always have this, you know, DK. You know, it's dependence on the Kähler potential. And so the scale of Planck scale is sitting in the problem. So there's, there's this thing that people often say, that as you move a Planck distance in configuration space, you expect the structure of the potential to change. So it's hard to extrapolate. And uh, then taking that a bit further, you expect the potential to start to wiggle on that scale. And so very generally, there'll be one vacuum per uh, 
Planck unit, Planck uh, volume in this configuration space. And you can make that precise in the flux ensembles of flux vacua, that sort of thing. And there are potentially other dynamical roles that this volume can play. Okay, so it's not like we're ignorant of it. There are definitely, uh, you know, fairly sophisticated examples where uh, you can say a lot. Obviously, weak coupling gauge theory, you know, by assumption from renormalizability, the uh, Kähler potential and the Baer theory. There's this whole class of n equals two theories where uh, the metric on the vector multiple moduli space is determined by supersymmetry in terms of a holomorphic prepotential, and so now the holomorphy arguments apply. And of course, we have uh, the cyber witten solutions, and we have all this structure from special geometry of uh, Claude Vial that allows us to compute in principle a metric on a Claude Vial moduli space. And so those are rich examples, and those are the ones where almost all the you know, actual concrete, you know, precise work on the subject are based. So the basic example of this would be uh, just you know, U1 gauge theory, or perhaps you know, Yang Mills with a unbroken U1 in the IR. And as is familiar, if you have charge matter, the beta function drives that to be uh, IR free theory. And uh, then that shows up in the prepotential since it controls the gauge coupling. And then that implies a particular term in the modularized space metric, this logarithmic uh, correction. So A squared log A squared in the Potential and Kähler potential gives you a log term in the metric. And so that's a very familiar, mildly singular behavior. In particular, it describes not just uh, gauge theory, it describes this conical limit that I was referring to before. And the uh, n equals 2 theory, as you approach a conical point, the metric has this mild logarithmic behavior that's integrable, so the conical point is at a finite distance. So, uh, okay, so, so now what are we going to do with this? I'm going to really give you an example of uh, some work in progress with a uh, student, uh, Gonzalo Taroba, and postdoc at Rutgers, Jesse Shelton, that uh, takes, takes this conifold kind of or you know, n equals one super Yang null system and uh, you know, tries to do something a little new. This, this started in a search for generic models of uh, low-scale supersymmetry breaking. So there's been a lot of work on that and a lot of work on metastable vacua. And at present, it's still not clear that we have models that uh, are generic in string theory, in, in that they all still require either some sort of tuning of parameters or assumption of symmetries like discrete R symmetry that is not obvious or generic in string theory. But of course, people have just scratched the surface and maybe many other things to look for. Of course, if it's going to be generic, you would hope that it would be revealed, revealed by a simple model. And probably the simplest model of simple symmetry breaking in uh, string theory would be to consider wrapped anti-brains. So in particular, if you get uh, n equals 1 theory by wrapping the five brains on a two cycle, then if you wrap anti d five brains, well, anti-brains by rights should break supersymmetry. And, uh, this might work. So to be a little bit more precise, if you start with n equals 2 theory, the difference between a brain and anti-brain is just reversing orientation, and you find that uh, it still preserves a supersymmetry. It just changes the sign in the covariant constant sphere condition, but it's a different n equals 1 subalgebra of n equals 2. And so if you take a system that has brain someplace, anti-brain someplace else, those of you that were here for Betty Kutuzov's talk saw explicit examples of uh, brains and Betty and flax space doing this. You expect to break the full supersymmetry. Okay, and then uh, in a realistic string compactification, one could take that model, or one could uh, just take other as aspects of the construction, orientables, the standard model brains that break the n equals one, and now put in this anti-brain that preserves the other n equals one, and therefore the combination will break supersymmetry. Okay, so now we can ask these standard questions about the effective field theory. And there's a very simple guess that you might make, and that's appeared in the literature various places. So we had this uh, very simple VI superpotential. We've changed brains to antibrains. 
antibrains are the opposite of brains, so we just flip the sign of the number of brains. We just put minus f in. Yes? Well, I, you have to argue that point. Okay, I just said simple guess, right? So we're just, we're just fooling around at this point. And uh, certainly if you try to guess the simplest description, you might try this. I, I agree, it's not manifest from the start that they should have this type of description. Did they study this one? No, I know, for example, the anti-D3 brain, which has been much discussed, doesn't work this way. That's right, it depends on the particular anti-brain. Yeah. So, uh, okay. So anyhow, uh, you know, I, I agree, you know, you might, you, you might be skeptical, but you, that should not stop you from trying it out, you know, as in the old days of duality. If it, you know, survives after five minutes, you know, it's probably right. And uh, <laughs> so, uh, okay. So, so anyhow, uh, you know, Vafa and collaborators, I mean, I actually did, did that. They took this seriously. And on the one hand, you know, it does have a supersymmetric vacuum, but obviously you flip the sign of the n sitting in the exponential. This is way off at some large s where you don't trust the superpotential anyways. But uh, now what you can notice is if you take, as we said, this is, you know, so this is really flux on the conifold, okay? So, so here's the crucial step. We're not going to interpret it as anti-D5 minutes. We're going to grant the validity of that duality and uh, say this is what we get if we reverse the sign of the Lumon Ramon flux in this conifold solution, okay? So that, that's the basic uh, answer to your, your, your criticism, which is that it's hard to be sure about the brains, but as a compactification with fluxes and supergravity, that's a well-defined problem that we can just analyze and see what happens. So, as we discussed, we need to know not just the superpotential, but we need to know the Kähler potential. And we know that in this n equals 2 version of the conifold, we just compactify 2b on this conifold geometry, and we get this s squared log s. And so we plug that in, and lo and behold, we get a uh, potential which has a supersymmetry breaking minimum at an exponentially small value of s. It turns out that uh, this dependence of the metric following from the Kähler potential lifts the uh, s goes to zero limit of the potential. And uh, so there's actually this supersymmetry breaking minimum. Yeah. You're asking about uh, whether this is a full part of a full effective field theory, or you're asking whether. Uh, okay. Okay. Well, good. So the, the Gukov, So all this, if you argue from 2B compactific flux compactification, you can argue very generally for the Gukov alpha win that it's not normalized. And now this guy is much more specific, and I'll come back to that a property of the large volume limit, okay? And there you can compute it from Kuluta Klein reduction. So uh, it's exact, it, it's believed to be exact. There are, there are arguments to that effect. And then this one is exact in a limit. So you certainly have to discuss whether you're in that limit, but it's basically the large volume limit where you trust Kuluta Klein and supergravity. Yeah. Okay, so, uh, Okay, so, so very simple, you know, certainly looks kind of generic. And uh, now uh, with my collaborators, you know, we thought this was great. You know, let's, let's, let's just check that you know, we have low scale supersymmetry breaking and we'll go home. And uh, then you plug in uh, the solution into, you know, the F term and you find that where there was a cancellation, obviously, you know, for dW equals zero, there's a cancellation. Here, of course, you flip the sign, the two terms add, and you get basically log, you know, two log S, which is two m tau which is this order one value of supersymmetry breaking. And the underlying scale here is the scale of the flux compactification. It's set by the volume and the uh, string scale. But in any case, it's not exponentially small. It's just this high scale of supersymmetry breaking. Okay, so why, why is that? Okay, well, the, okay, well, first of all, you might, you know, say we've, we've, we've dropped the supergravity terms, we dropped lots of things, but actually that doesn't change this. Okay, so, 
it's actually not so unreasonable because uh, this is just n over g string, which, as you think about it, is in fact the tension of n anti d5 rings. You know, so you, you produce the dual to n anti d5 rings, and you should not be su surprised that you get the tension of n anti d5 rings as uh, the resulting you know, f term in vacuum energy. Okay, so it seemed like it failed, but now you realize that uh, well, you know, this is not Again, you know, the words behind this model are not new ones. You are supposed to be able to put an anti-brain and break supersymmetry at a low scale, but only because it's sitting down at the bottom of some warped thread. So there's a uh, you know, warp factor in this conifold compactification with fluxes. And although the brain had this high tension, if it's sitting down at the bottom of this warped thread, that leads to an effectively rescaled low breaking in the four-dimensional theory. Okay, and the problem basically is that, again, just what, uh, you know, Nadi perhaps uh, you know, implied, that we had computed this uh, Kähler potential and metric in the strict large volume limit. And in the strict large volume limit, you actually don't see warping. And uh, formally, that's because uh, the source for the warping is the number of fluxes multiplied by quantization in units of alpha prime. And now this is effectively the alpha prime goes to zero limit. So the source of the warping has gone away. But obviously, that's the wrong limit. You know, we, have, we would rather have the limit that uh, keeps the effects of the warping, scales up the number of brains, perhaps, as we take alpha prime goes to zero, to keep this effect of the warping, which is essential in getting low-scale breaking. OK, so, so again, that's been discussed in the literature in some level, in particular our work of getting and collaborators. And there is a candidate expression for the Kähler potential, which takes into account the warp mode. OK, so here's the warp metric. There's a function A, which you have to solve moderately complicated equations of motion to get. And then the function sits in front of the four-dimensional part of the metric, and the inverse function sits in front of the six-dimensional metric. And then it's basically the square of this function that sits in the volume term in the standard formula for this uh, Kähler potential for the metric on Calabial moduli space. And this is just, it's a natural thing. This is the warped volume. You know, this is a, you could test this and you can derive it from kaluza klein reduction. Okay, so there it is. Now, uh, you know, although this, 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 this derivation is, is in the literature and it's been, you know, you know, there's been several papers about it. There are very basic things which uh, we, we looked at this and we were not at all sure we believed it. And uh, one basic problem is that you can also just compute the metric on moduli space, again, from Kutzer Klein reduction. And you get an expression in terms of the uh, integrals over 2, 1 form. So if you know about Claudia geometry, these are associated with the moduli. Clearly, if this is going to be a you know, metric in supergravity, it has to be that this comes from two derivatives on this. But there is a difference naively between them, which is that the two derivatives also act on this function A. Okay, so the naive relation, which was valid without warping, is you differentiate the big omegas to get these cons, but now you have correction terms to that. But obviously, this relation had better not be corrected if you're going to hope to use supergravity, effective supergravity. Okay, and it's not that easy to study because of the complexity of the equations that determine this act. Okay, so, uh, so there are various questions both of formalism and a principle, and so people had not, in any sense, established this. And uh, so to really study it properly, we said, well, you know, at least a console, we have this 10-dimensional solution. No question? It's not holomorphic. I'm sorry, hol holography. Yeah, well, you could say that that's what we're doing, holography. Well, so we're, we all assuming holography in the sense that we're working on the gravity side of the duality. And that's what we're about to do. That's what we're about to do. Yes. <laughs> so, OK. So, so in any case, that's right. We're in this fortunate situation where thanks to the hard work of uh, Klevenov, Strassler, and uh, collaborators, we have this explicit 10-dimensional uh, work solution. You know, so you can see it's rather complicated. And I just wrote down one, you know, the, the, the expression for the work factor. But it's there. And so you can check that, well, yes, flipping the flux to minus, you know, to minus n does give you a solution. And almost every place n just enters as n squared. So all, you know, the discussion leading up to this is correct. And you can just compute in principle. 
and uh, I won't uh, cite the you know, you know, scholastic calculation, but uh, in fact, uh, it's not that hard. You have expressions for these two one forms, and those are the things that enter in understanding supersymmetry breaking, so coupling to the, uh, gravitino, between the gravitino and the Goldstino in particular. And having done that calculation, you can see that, in fact, it is reflected in the four-dimensional effective supergravity that you would have tried to write using these ingredients. So here's an expression for this uh, 2-1 form, and uh, the, uh, you know, that, that does couple in, that, that sits in this uh, you know, perturbed covariantly constant spinner equation in exactly the place it should to reflect the standard formula where the F term governs the coupling to the uh, Goldstein-O. So, so on that level, you can see that the four-dimensional effective supergravity analysis will describe the supersymmetry breaking. And, you know, we, you, know you can go on and, 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 and you know, see, and this certainly is an example, and to some extent generally, that there are, you know, there are worries about the validity of these warped Kähler expression are, uh, you know, not, you know, you know, can, you know, can be addressed, that, that you can demonstrate the validity of this type of formula. So the issue that this works is difficult because the Kähler form changed. Because what changed? The Kähler form changed. That's right, exactly. So, uh, so how did the Kähler form, how did the Kähler potential change? Okay, so, uh, well, we, we have the same super potential, and we have to compute this warped Kähler potential in metric. And uh, to a good approximation, you know, these forms really are supported down in the bottom of the throat, and you just integrate down in the bottom of the throat. So these complica the complexities of the solution are reduced, and uh, what you find is you find, here's the metric. It's got the log term, which we knew about, and it's got a new term. It's got a term that goes as 1 over s to the 4 thirds. And it's not a total mystery where this term comes from. Actually, if you just uh, look at the uh, R-dependence of this uh, two-worm form, it, uh, you, you, you integrate and you see that you're just measuring, in a sense, the, the volume of the bottom of this thread. This two-worm form is something simple. And you get this correction term. And it's a rather surprising correction term from the point of view of uh, special geometry or other treatments that it actually diverges as s goes to zero, which you can show never happens in Calabi-Yau geometry. I mean, you know, mathematicians have analyzed this. And of course, in the s goes to zero limit, this term dominates the s term. And uh, so uh, this, 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 this is an alternate calculation that came. And it's, it's, it's amusing because there's even a kind of a quote uh, you know, gauge theory argument you might give for this term, which is that, you know, well, in, in recoupling the uh, operator S had canonical dimension three, how do you add a term to the Kähler potential that then, you know, has the naive dimension two while well, you take the two-thirds power of that? And, of course, the uh, true gauge theory problem is a uh, strongly coupled problem, so you, you probably would not trust this expression, but nevertheless, there it is in the calculation from supergravity. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. It, it was there, so uh, <laughs> we were quite, <laughs> quite, quite interested when we we noticed that. But uh, it's, yeah, it, 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 <laughs> so uh, okay. So so you can so you can plug this into uh, the formulas for the supersymmetry breaking scale, and well, indeed, you know, if you take the vacuum that we took, you get a. Uh, low scale of breaking because of the work factor sits in the metric. You know, it's not in the E to decay term, which is where it's in, in some, in, in, for some purposes it's in the E to decay term, but in this problem it's in the metric, the work factor. Okay, and so, so it actually works, and you do get low scale breaking because of the work factor. Okay, now, we should say that there is a problem if you think about it. This is where a, a graph might have helped, but uh, anyhow, because of the work factor, it's evident that the effective potential is going to zero as S goes to zero, because everything's getting worked down to zero by this exponential amount. So therefore, uh, given that we had positive vacuum energy at finite S and zero at S, this is, you know, the, the, although the solution is a critical point, it's hardly a stable vacuum. You just roll down to S equals zero. Okay, and in fact, that's sort of inevitable in this, that, uh, you know, if, you know this, 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 if, if, if there's only one scale in the problem and this warping is sending the energy to zero, obviously it's going to roll down to zero and S goes to zero. And then the metastable theories that work 
work because they have two scales. You, know, you need a more complicated potential to hope to have a minimum away from S equals zero. So this was a little bit too simple what I described to get a stable vacuum. Yeah. Ah, very interesting. Okay, I'm not sure. I'll, I'll, I'll explain what this thing is. But it's not a vacuum. It's not a conventional vacuum. Yeah, that's right. That was, that's, this, this is a uh, su suggestion that has been made in the past. So there are two, there are two questions that this raises. Okay, so uh, one question, the more pragmatic one, is well, you know, we, we don't like this. Let's put in something else to stabilize the vacuum away from S equals zero. And uh, you can actually do it in, if you take into account the supergravity from bulk corrections. And more specifically, there's a constant term added to this S log S in the uh, supergravity analysis in this period. And this, the constant term sitting inside the minus 3W squared actually gives you a term that pushes you away from S equals zero. So you could actually make, uh, you know, we, we didn't make a full contact example, but you could make stabilized vacua away from S equals zero, although it's happening not purely because of the you know, exponential effects, but it's, you're, you're balancing with a bulk term. You know, so it's not obvious that this is naturally a small, you know, an exponentially small scale, but uh, you, know, you could stabilize the vacuum. Now, now, there's this more interesting question which you raised, which I think I didn't write a slide for, but we have uh, started to study, which is you know, what, you know, what, what is this thing? You know, is this a, some sort of new vacuum that goes to zero? Okay, so, so, the, so the first hypothesis you might make is to say, well, not really, because as S goes to zero, we know that uh, you know the thing is matching on to the singular manifold, and the curvatures must become large, and uh, so we don't trust the solution there. But that is wrong. Okay, so if you look back at you know Klevenoff and Strassler, it, it's quite amusing because uh, the warp factor sitting in front of the six dimensions conspires with the scale dependence. Basically, you can pull the scale dependence out of the six dimensional, you know, the throat part of the metric, and they just cancel. So the solution actually has a finite uh, S goes to zero limit. There's just this you know, definite size of the S3 in, you know, <coughs> I guess in, this is in string frame, in, uh, you know, determined by G, GN, you know, G, G string N. And so if G string N is large, the curvature is small. And you do trust the solution in that regime. So that's not the resolution. Rather, what the resolution is, is that it's not that the warp factor disappears, it's just that all the effect of the warping sits in front of the four-dimensional part of the metric. And so as you roll down to S goes to zero, you have this uh, prefactor like S squared in front of the four-dimensional part of the metric. And uh, so all of your length scales. It's not to say that you're rolling down to some you know, sensible, you know, fixed four-dimensional theory at S equals zero. It's to say that you've blown up the whole four-dimensional space by the warp factor running to zero. And so it's not a uh, stable, you know, it's not a static four-dimensional solution, and particularly you work the pawn direction, you know, so you have a non-trivial dynamical solution in the four-dimensional theory. So it's not a, four, it's not a new four-dimensional vacuum. It's not something that has an obvious gauge theory interpretation. So, so it's interesting, but uh, in any case, uh, yeah, we continue to study this thing. Okay, so, so let me switch topics a bit. Were there other questions about uh, this uh, this thing because of you know as I as I said you know this is just one part of this kind of broader question can you control the Taylor potential in uh, supersymmetric theories and uh, so that was an example of what can happen when you put the warp factor in to the closed string part of the theory but what about uh, you know all the rest of the theory you know like the open strings or the uh, actual particles in the standard model where you might actually want to compute the you call a couple of the masses and so forth. Okay, so this is a very long standing problem. It's effectively there in well, 85, you know, from the original work of Candelas and so forth. And uh, very little has been done on this problem. Okay, so, so how would you do it in this uh, heterotic string compactification? Well, as you know, you, you find a Calabi L, you, know, you find the Ricci flat metric. Then in the more modern, you know, zero two compactifications, you have to find a gauge connection that solves these Hermitian Yang Mills equations. So it's a little simpler than Yang Mills, but but not much. You know, you need to solve this uh, condition on the curvature. And uh, then what would you do? Then you have to actually so 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 then all the fields in the low dimensional theory are going to correspond to various uh, you know either uh, 
you know, solutions of massless solutions of the Dirac equation, or their their partners, which are basically variations of the gauge connection that satisfy the linearized version of these Hermitian Yang Mills equations. So now you have to start finding a basis of harmonic forms, and then you integrate them in the six-dimensional metric, and then finally that's it. That's the that's the metric. You know, that's the thing which would be two derivatives on this Kähler potential. And so you can spell out every step again in the large volume limit. Of course, there would then be you know stringy corrections to all of this, but uh, it's not been done in any any example. It's been done in n equals two examples because this is the metric on instant time modulized space. But uh, again, that's that's you know not the case of direct interest. Okay, so why has there been so little work on this? Well, you know, first of all, it's clear that uh, all these expressions depend, you know, explicitly and implicitly on the metric on the Calabi Allen. So step one would be to get the Ritchie flat metric on the Calabi Allen. Of course, we don't know what that is either, except in fairly trivial cases, you know, Torah and so forth. And we know it exists, but most of the study of string compactification has been, you know, the development of clever ways to not have to know that metric, okay? But here's a problem where, you know, you, well, okay, let, let's, let's pursue that, okay? What is the clever way to solve this problem if you don't know the metric on the Calabiao, okay? So there's a, you know, hope, which is certainly a, you know, attractive hope that uh, just as there was special geometry that, uh, you know, so, so, so naively, you, you would also have to know this metric to compute the metric on the closed string moduli space, you know, these complex structure moduli and things, but actually we know how to do it without that because of the structure of special geometry and all this math. So, so maybe we should look for the open string special geometry, and there clearly is open string special geometry, so that's a, that's a worthy thing to work on, but it's, it's, it's very likely, if you look at the, the structure behind it, that it, unlike the closed string case, it does not determine this metric, you know, it's just some partial information. And uh, there's a fairly simple argument in uh, the type two, the brain context, that uh, it's going to be hard to skip this step of you know, solving for the metric. So what, what's the argument? The argument is that uh, you know, all these different brain theories, you know, you know, so you could dualize heterotic to type one, you would wrap D9 brains on the Claudia, you would put some sort of gauge fields and so forth. And uh, that's the problem we, we were discussing, that of course by doing mirror symmetries and t dualities and things, you turned out into other problems. So they should all be kind of roughly the same order of difficulty. And the basic problem of this type is to take the uh, you know, D3, or you know, say the D0 brain, the point that the brain that just sits at a point on the Claudia, and it moves around on the Claudia, and it has a moduli space, and we don't have to calculate. We know that one, that's the Claudia. And it has a metric on the moduli space, and what is it? Well, it's just the metric on the Claudia, because it's just a particle moving around. So there, the, the, the answer to the question is, by definition, the metric on the Claudia. So you cannot solve that problem without finding it. And there's not really a good reason to think that the other t-dual related problems are simpler than that one. So you just have to kind of, I think, I would say bite the bullet and have some way of working on this uh, metric on the problem. Yeah. Okay, so we saw this uh, you know, non-contact solution. The actual you know, pure Ritchie flat metric was previous work of Ken Dallas and Della Oso that was used in this klevenoff strassler solution. And you can write it out. I didn't in my slides. It's, moderately complicated. And you can get more metrics like that for, you know, singul you know, regions of singularities and so forth. But even there, you know, you start to reach the point where you can't get exact expressions. So, so you could do that. Okay, you could take the attitude that, uh, well, you know, all the interesting stuff is happening near these singularities. So let's, let's patch together and plug in, you know, these, these known metrics near the singularities onto some sort of crude approximate metric on the Calabian. Yeah. So it's not that hard to get crude approximate met metric. So here's the example of the quintic, the, the solution of this equation equals zero in five variables on complex projective four space. And what you can just say is let's just take a you know, very simple metric on the four space, you know, the thing with Kähler potential log absolute z squared, and restrict that to the Calabian yeah, sitting in this thing. And that, that's a metric, you know, it's not Ritchie flat, but maybe it's good enough. You know, and for some problems, it's probably good enough. But, uh, you know, you can, you can study the error, and it's not a, not a great approximation, as you would imagine. Okay, so, so uh, another way to proceed is to say, well, you know, probably an approximate metric is what we're going to do, but we, we would just like a systematic, you know, approximation scheme where if we have to do 
you know, you know, we need some particular accuracy, we can improve the approximation to get to that level of accuracy. And uh, so uh, that's what we have been pursuing. It was inspired by you know, some mathematical work. And uh, so here's a slightly more general onset to the type I just described. So instead of uh, absolute z squared, you could put in coefficients to sum up the different uh, polynomial z, z bar with different weights. And although in the example I gave, you would find that the best approximation is the identity matrix, that's just because of symmetry. And there's some other moduli on the Calabial, you would do better to vary this matrix of coefficients and you could get a better approximation. So you would have a 25 parameter family of metrics and you could say, well, you know, what's, what's the best approximation to the Ricci flat metric within that 25 parameter family? Okay, so now 25 parameters are not very many and you might want more. And so a way to get more would be to say, well, why don't we just uh, you know, double this thing? And we get you know, two log. That's the same as log z squared, z bar squared. And now we have a matrix with uh, four indices, four you know, taking values one to five, or basically 225 coefficients in this case. And you can see that you know, by continuing this, you at least have as many coefficients as you might desire to represent uh, the metric with whatever accuracy you desire. But uh, now, of course, you face the problem of computing the coefficients. And uh, well, you know, there's a lot you can say about this. But there's actually a very, very pretty kind of mathematical definition called the balance metric, which is a preferred value of uh, this matrix that it turns out to give you a succession of approximations to the Ricci flat metric. And I'll just give you the formula and I'll give you a sort of a physical, not a, well, it's going to be hard to quite to see how that turns into this formula, but I think it's a, a good physical way to think about it. Okay, so, so the definition is you regard this guy as a matrix. So you group together all the holomorphic indices as capital I and all the anti-holomorphic indices as you know, capital J bar, and you group together all these powers, you know, so, you know, monomials of a given degree, two here or K, as these S capital I's. And uh, now you compute uh, this type of integral. You integrate over the manifold a product SS bar, so, you know, a term in this type of expression normalized by the actual value using this metric C, C contracted with SS bar. Okay, so that's something of degree zero. You know, the actual scale of these E's cancels out of that expression, so it's a scalar. So you can integrate it, and by varying the choice of IJ up here, you get a matrix. Okay, and then you invert it, and you get another matrix like this. And the claim is that there is a unique solution of this fixed point condition that says that when you do these integrals and invert, you get back the same matrix, and that's the balanced metric. And, uh, you know, so it's at least reasonably simple to describe. And in fact, there's a very simple way to find it on a computer, which is to say, start with some C, you know, do this calculation to get a next C, and just iterate that process. And this actually will converge on that uh, solution of the fixed point condition. So it's a nice equation in that sense. Okay, so, so what is this, you know, how would you ever guess that? You know, unless by, well, we guessed it by reading, you know, Donaldson's papers. That was not, you know, <laughs> very uh, imaginative. But uh, there is a uh, more physical, at least, uh, description of the condition that I gave, which uh, actually you can motivate uh, by a black hole problem. I didn't uh, set it all up in my transparencies, but this comes up if you, say, look at a black hole in two A string on Calabial with a D0 and D4 charge, and then you put in a probe, which is a D2 wrapped on the horizon of the black hole. And if those of you that have looked at that system, that turns into a problem in quantum mechanics in a magnetic field, the magnetic field of the D4 brain flux, you know, integrated over this S2. Okay, and then that'll be the system that I'm talking about in these slides. So that's the source of a magnetic field on the Calabial, some sort of D4 brain flux now integrated over the horizon of the black hole gives us a magnetic field on the Calabial. And now you study the quantum mechanics of a particle in this magnetic field. And as you know, if you truncate down to the lowest energy level, there's a finite multiplicity of states in that lowest energy level, the lowest Landau level. Okay, so uh, what do you say? Well, those, in fact, are closely related. They are they're, they're ingredients in the uh, space of BPS states of that black hole. So again, there are various of these counting arguments that uh, take this space of states and uh, 
one way of doing it is to say that you, you start in five dimensions, you get a black string, and each of these guys is a, a field on that black string. And then the, uh, that, that com the, uh, the, the density of states in that conformal field theory is that of the black hole, you know, where the momentum is the D0 charge. Another version of this argument takes the various D0s, partitions them, and treats the uh, you know, components of a given, you know, of given D0 charge as uh, D2s using the Myers effect. And then the dynamics of these D2s are described by this quantum mechanics. And you combine all those states together and you describe the black hole. So there's a close, you know, this is an ingredient, this probe problem, in the quantum mechanics of the black hole. And the lowest level, level is an ingredient of the Hilbert space of uh, BPS states. And then there's a standard thing you can do if you have a holomorphic connection. If the two zero and zero two parts are, are, are zero, you can do a complex gauge transformation in the wave function that turns the del bar part of the, uh, you know, the, you know, the del bar curve and derivative exactly into del bar. So the lowest lambda level are exactly the del bar psi equals zero, the holomorphic sections of a line bundle with this curvature f. And so that's the contact between this physical problem and this uh, mathematical literature. OK, so now the idea of the balanced uh, metric from this point of view, and, and it's something that you know, is, is a plausible thing to say in this black hole problem, is that what we're going to do is we're going to look at the maximal entropy state of the particle. And again, this will be you know, closely related to, to looking at the maximal entropy state of the black hole. So what is the maximal entropy state of this particle in this quantum mechanics? OK, well, there's a definition, which is that we have a basis for the uh, states. We're just taking you know, zero energy states. And uh, we just say, you know, each state appears with equal probability. You know, there's n states in the Hilbert space. We can form a density matrix where each state appears with this probability 1 over n, and that's the maximal entropy density matrix. Okay, so that's, that's a well-defined thing. Okay, so now there's another condition that you might try to put and say that this has something to do with maximal entropy, which is to say that uh, this is a, you know, particle, you know, with this, you know, D2 brain probe sitting at a point on the club, you know, and so if we know the state or the density matrix, we can compute the position space. You know, we can just compute the probability that the particle sits at some point z, and that gives us a probability distribution of the, over the cloud. Yeah. And now it's tempting to say that, well, you know, this is maximal entropy. It should not favor any point on the cloud. Yeah. And so this probability distribution should be a constant. And that's also a fairly plausible, at least to me, thing to say about the probe, but in general, these two are different conditions, clearly. That's a quantum condition, and that's a classical condition. You could just compute uh, this guy by solving for the explicit uh, basis functions and uh, summing up their you know, norm squared to z. And you know, given that you can compute it, it would be a miracle if it came out to be constant. And of course, it's generally not going to come out to be constant. You know, it doesn't prove it, it can't be. It's just you, you do this calculation, and you don't really expect it to be. But exactly this condition of the balanced metric. So if the magnetic field is proportional to the Kähler form, then you can show that this funny looking formula I wrote down here, this is basically the translation of the orthogonality, the, you know, the computation of the matrix of inner products on the uh, you know, basis states, you know, the lowest lambda level. And this is exactly the condition that uh, the or thought, you know, if you, if you compute an orthonormal basis, you reproduce exactly this metric so that uh, the, uh, you know, this diagonal of the Green's function is exactly constant. It turns out that's just, you know, rereading the uh, condition for a balanced metric in this uh, physical language. And so it's actually true. There is, there is a special choice of magnetic field and metric for which both of these things can be true. And uh, that's the balanced metric. And so it's a very you know, special preferred metric, even in this physical sense. And it's tempting, and we're looking at the uh, hypothesis that actually, if you do put the probe in this black hole background, some finite charge, of course, if it were you know, the supergravity limit, you would get a Ritchie flat metric, you can show. But ha that having taken the stringy corrections into account, we're looking at the hypothesis that, in fact, it sums up to this balanced metric. So that would be an attractive. Uh, interpretation of this balance metric in a physical problem.
So, uh, it's, so it's a pretty thing, and it does approximate this uh, Ritchie flat metric. You can develop a uh, you know, heat kernel-like expansion for this diagonal of the Green's function, and uh, it has an expansion-like constant plus scalar curvature divided by k, the number of you know the strength of the magnetic field, plus corrections in a series of one over k. So as k goes to infinity, setting this thing to constant is exactly setting r to you know zero in the case at hand. This works for non coabials with you know constant curvature as well. If k is finite, you get these corrections that come from balancing these terms. And uh, so then you can you know study all this numerically as I did with uh, Karp, Lukic, and uh, Reinbacher, and it works. It gives you a pretty good approximation to the uh, Ritchie flat metric. So here, as you scale up the k, is a graph of uh, how good the Ritchie scalar is. You know, it should be zero. It's order one down in this original approximation of k equals one, and now it gets down to uh, you know less than. This is we went a little higher than this, but you know better than ten percent. You can get it down to a few percent just with uh, PC. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, this is a lot more efficient. This is actually not the best scheme because you can, there, there's also an action that gives this. I mean, you can think of it in that spirit. You can find schemes that actually get better. This gets a one over k squared, actually, leading error. I mean, you can find, you know, kind of corrective schemes that, that, that do better. But uh, basically the answer is yes, that the, 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 the potential problem with your scheme, I mean, it's an interesting scheme, but, you know, the question is basically, you know, to the extent that your function is nice and convex, it works very well. And to the extent that your function is all wavy and bad, it won't work. And you can prove that this function is nice and convex, and so you just head straight towards this minimum. Yeah. But there, could, there, there are probably better schemes. But this is, in a way, the, the mathematically simplest. It, it may have this other you know, direct interpretation within string theory. So, uh, OK, so just uh, another example of improving the accuracy. Uh, this is uh, what you get if you take that original k equals 1 metric, and uh, you just look at a sphere, an S2 inside the claw VL, and uh, you, know, you just project on you know, you know, the metric down on that. And it's something that you can argue by symmetry should have been round in the uh, Ritchie flat metric. And it's obviously not round for k equals 1. So this gives you some picture of how far you are from the correct thing. And now you start solving for better and better and you can graphically see it uh, improve. So uh, that's the you know, few percent accuracy that we got. And so you know, certainly one can get results on these Ritchie flat metrics and perhaps someday address some of these physical questions I started with. So I'll stop there. Question? Yeah, yeah, that's right. You could embed all this in a compactification. Yeah. More or less. Uh, if you have a more specific question, you know, I could. Yeah, yeah. Well, uh, I, I, I guess I would say that's. So he wants to know when you would believe you can do a, you, you write a effective potential from supergravity in terms of a superpotential and a Taylor potential, and you know, when, when can you study supersymmetry breaking in that language? Surely there are necessary conditions, and I, I, I'm, you know, I'm sure you would agree, and I would agree that there are necessary conditions. Now, this condition that. The, the scalar breaking is far below you know, all the dynamical scales, I would tend to say, is a stronger condition than you would need in general. 
And uh, it could be a long discussion. I think we could come up with examples where you needed that condition. What I'll say in the case we're studying, again, this is derived from supergravity. You can just look at the analysis and see that, yeah, this, this reproduces the 10-dimensional condition in, in the supergravity. So there, you trust it. The loophole in that kind of coin, besides you know, having to compute some of these things from 10 dimensions at the moment, is that, of course, uh, you know, it could be that other modes drop down and become light. And uh, then in supergravity, that's, you know, in, in classical theory, that's not saying you don't have a solution. But if one of those went tachyonic, of course, then the solution will be incorrect. But it doesn't happen in this case. So, uh, yeah, I mean, it's certainly something to, to, to worry about in general. I don't, I don't, I, I, the, 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 the simple criteria, like you said, I think are too conservative. And you can see in this example that, yeah. 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 You know, I agree. Well, I mean, even in the problem we had, I, I did skip a step, an essential step, which is that uh, you have to stabilize the Taylor moduli for this thing, you know, really to give you, you know, such a vacuum, and then that actually changes this, at least this minus 3w squared. So, you, so up to that point, you, as I said, you can, you can verify all this from 10-dimensional supergravity, and it will be exact. Again, in a limit, you know, I've combined large volume and scaling up to fluxes to keep a work factor, and so that's a case where, you know, it, it's all correct. Now, I think to make any comparable discussion in generality, you would want either a microscopic or, or a dual formulation, you know, and, 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 and then in those contexts, I think, uh, Again, the criterion. So, so you might, you know, go on. You didn't, but you might go on to to make the criterion that, uh, well, yes, we we do not want to. Uh, you know, we have to justify integrating out down to the mass of the fields we're talking about to trust this effective potential. And it's certainly true if we want to believe that we have a particle of that mass. But if you're just trying to parameterize the configuration space and find minimum of effective potential, I still think even that criterion. Is, is, is more conservative, you know, than, you know, you, you know there, there would be cases where this does describe the potential landscape. You could justify it from a microscopic theory. But again, it's a very open-ended discussion. And uh, I, I will fully agree that uh, in any given example, if you push forward, you have to think about this point and justify the use of this potential. Yes. Well, again, we, we in principle can solve, you know, 10-dimensional supergravity and get that's compactifications without. It's an approximation. That's right. It's it's. It, but it, again, it's in a limit that keeps more of the physics. It's in this large volume limit where you scale the the fluxes to keep the warp factor. Of course, you've thrown away, you know, alpha prime and g-string directions and so forth. So it's not exact in that sense. But it's a precise limit that's keeping more of the physics. I think that's where we can get exact answers at present. Yeah. No, no, we should we should talk about it. I, as you know, I only learned about the baryonic branch from you the other day. So, yeah.